Okay, Kabbalah Decoded, uh, Wednesday night. So tonight's uh, class is about the cycles of time and cycles of the soul. Now, this needs to really be explained. What exactly is it that, uh, that I'm talking about here? Well, <clears throat> the cycle of time is, uh, is, is, is easy enough to understand. Um, time obviously is cyclical and uh, it tends to repeat itself just like the seasons repeat themselves and so on and so forth. Uh, so too, um, the concept of time is repetitive except that as we've explained on many occasions before, even though it's cyclical, it is nevertheless uh, goes upwards in a spiral. We've explained that before, um, that's talking about in the larger picture. Uh, in terms of the, the entire span of time um, and also time in the year. The years are on a sort of an orbit that um, um, constantly moves upwards in a spiral, as we've explained uh, before. What I want to explain this week is the concept of the seven days of the week. <clears throat> Now, interestingly enough, all those who, all those societies um, who have had calendars, who have made calendars, it seems um, that all calendars basically go on a seven-day week. <clears throat> and uh, even though I believe it was Napoleon that tried to actually introduce a 10-day uh, week, it did not go well for him. Um, he was... Um, there was almost a revolution, and uh, as a result, because a uh, 10-day week just didn't seem to didn't seem to work out. I guess he wanted it to fit in with a metric system that was developed uh, around that time, and so I thought a 10-day week might be a good idea, even though you would have two days off instead of one day off. But nevertheless, um, it uh, it caused quite an uproar, and the reason it caused an uproar, really, even in the society in France and uh, various other places which he conquered was that the Sabbath day now sort of just became another day. It wasn't a culmination of the week and then you start the week again. So the cycle of time I really want to talk about now is the cycle of time as it is expressed in the process of creation in the Bible, in the Torah. Obviously, the day starts off with uh, the first day of the week being Sunday, and the final day, the seventh day of the week, is uh, the Sabbath day. Now, interestingly enough, um, each day, says the Zohar, each day of the week, each day of creation, avi davidete. Each day of creation did its own work. And we can see if we look at the process of creation, the various things that were created um, through the days, through the seven days of the week, give us a clue also as to what the week itself is, uh, is all about. So the first day of the week was really the creation of light. It was the creation of light. So it's the day... Uh, as we'll discuss Kabbalistically in a minute, the day that corresponds to the Sfira, the emanation of Chesed, Chesed, kindness, loving kindness, because that's the idea of light. Light just spreads out everywhere and it doesn't discern between whether it's shining on the king's palace or it's shining on a, on a garbage heap. It's all the same thing as far as, uh, as far as the light is concerned. It doesn't make any difference. The second day of creation was the day that the Rakia was created, the day of the Rakia. The Rakia is the firmament, as it's usually translated, but basically the Rakia means the separation between higher and lower, or as the, uh, the Torah puts it, between the upper waters and the lower waters, between two states of being, a higher state of being and a lower state of being. That corresponds, as we'll see, to the Sphira of Gavura. Gavura meaning um, harshness or um, restriction. Harshness or restriction. Then, um, on the third day, things are actually harmonized 
and what was incomplete on the second day becomes comp uh, on the second day yeah becomes complete now on the third day and the um, the third day of creation therefore corresponds to the sphira of Tiferet. I'll go a little bit more into this uh, in a minute. Corresponds to the sphira of Tiferet. The fourth day of the week corresponds uh, to the sphira that comes after Tiferet, which is Netzach. And it was then that the uh, the sun and the moon and the stars were, so to speak, hung in the sky, according to the story of creation in Genesis, the account of creation. And so it goes on until we get to uh, the seventh day, the sixth day is when man, the fifth day, animals, and birds, etc. were created. And man was created really on the sixth day and placed in the Garden of Eden. Um, the creation of, of life, of living creatures, of, uh, of, of plants and living creatures, etc. on the fifth day. And uh, the creation of man on the sixth day, this was, uh, these correspond to the sphere of Hod and Yesod. And finally, the Sabbath day is the day of Malchut, corresponding to the sphere of Malchut, which is really what I want to talk about uh, primarily uh, for reasons that you'll understand shortly. But in order to be able to um, explain this properly, I'm going to do a share screen and um, let me just get there. Um, hmm. Supposed to be another, just one second, folks. There is supposed to be a thing of the Svirotian. I don't see it. One second. I'll be with you shortly. Here it is. Okay. Right, can everybody see that? Uh, yeah, you can see it? Yeah? Okay, very good. Okay, so we look at the Svirot. Now, we're not going to concentrate on the upper Svirot and the higher Svirot, Keta Chochma Dat, Keta, Keta Chochma Bina and Dat. We're going to concentrate on the lower Svirot. Now, if anyone wants a picture, wants a copy of this, you can find it in the um, in the Dropbox link. Uh, you just go to the website, uh, kabbaladikoto.com, and uh, then you can look. Sorry, the telephone's ringing. Turn it off. Uh, you can just look into um, um, the, I think it's the videos tab. If you go to the videos tab, um, there's a form that you fill out, click on the, just fill out the form. Uh, it, your information not shared. Uh, just have to know who's, uh, downloading stuff in case someone tries to upload anything, <laughs> uh, which I don't want over there. Um, so you download, uh, stuff into, um, you, you can, uh, just open the, uh, open the link. And then you will see over there a chart of the Svirot. I've sent it out before um, to everyone, I think. If you don't have it, you can download it from there. Everything over there is uh, free access. So you can download it from there and have a look. Okay, so we are going to go now a little bit more um, deeply into explaining the various uh, correspondences. And why I want to do this is because there's a teaching, a very interesting teaching, from the Magid Mizrich. The Magid Mizrich was the successor to the Baal Shem Tov. And he says, he explains that just as there is a, um, just as is, as each day of the week, Avid Avidete, each day of the week does its own work, each way a day of the week does its own thing, each day of the week has its own, um, its own character, so to speak, and its own things, so too the soul goes through the same cycle that the soul on each day of the week, one of these attributes, the attribute of that particular day, illuminates the soul. Now the soul has all of these attributes, all of these powers of the soul, but he suggests that not only does this happen automatically, that because the day is illuminated by the sphira. The first day of the week is illuminated by the Sfirah of Chesed. The second day of the week by the Sfirah of Gevura. 
if you can see now my um, my arrow here. Um, the fourth day, the third day of the week, Tiferet is um, illuminated by um, um, is illuminated by Tiferet, and so on and so forth. Um, so let's see if I can. I'll tell you what I will do. Here we go. I might highlight uh, text colors or whatever it is over here. Okay. So, all right. So, uh, so, the, so the Magid Mizrich says that not only does this happen automatically, but one should make it like a weekly plan, so to speak. One should um, emphasize on each day of the week, pay attention to that svira, that quality, that divine emanation, which corresponds to that day of the week. So therefore, on the first day, one would concentrate on the concept of chesed. On the second day, one would concentrate on the concept of uh, gvura, and so on and so forth uh, until you get to the Shabbat, where one would concentrate on the sphere of Malchut. Let me just move it down a drop, move it up a drop rather, and there we go. Okay. So we're going to now explain what that means in terms of um, doing something practically. Practically, what do we mean? Practically, what must happen? So, the earlier svirot are somewhat easier to, to explain. It's malchut that needs a lot more explanation. So, let's start off. Sunday, kindness, love, emotional connection, etc. So the concept of the first day of the week, the day which is closest to the Sabbath, after the Sabbath, the Zohar says about this, that minay midbarchin kulhu yoimin, that each, all the days that follow the Sabbath are blessed by the Sabbath. But obviously the day that's closest to the Sabbath after it is more blessed than the other days. Uh, the analogy is given of a person walking between two cities. As he leaves the last city, so as he's leaving the limits of the city to go out on the road into the darkness, so the lights of the city, he's walking at night, so the lights of the city accompany him a little bit of the way. They sort of illuminate his path for a while. But soon it gets completely dark until uh, the lights of the city that he's walking to, of the town that he's walking towards, start to lighten up the path again uh, and that he's walking down. So our sages explain that although all of the days of the week are blessed by the Sabbath, the first three days are more blessed by the previous Sabbath, and of course Sunday even more than the other two. From Wednesday onwards, it's already preparation for the new Sabbath, the Sabbath that is coming. And the sages also say that all the days of the week prepare for the Sabbath, and the Sabbath blesses all the days of the week that follow. So the days of the week prepare for the Sabbath, and the Sabbath then blesses the days of the week to come. So, the first day of the week, therefore, is very much influenced by the Sabbath which precedes it. So to speak, the light of the Sabbath illuminates, uh, illuminates Sunday. And therefore, the, uh, the, the work that is done on Sunday, the main work of Sunday, is to give out light to illuminate those around us, to illuminate our world around us. One should focus on that. What happens on the second day of the week, on the day of Gvura? So the day of Gvura in, um, in, in Kabbalah is much more the concept of withdrawing, withdrawing into oneself. Not withdrawing in a, in a, in a negative sense, but more focusing inwards and inward focusing. The, there's a famous um, uh, work um, written by King Solomon, Shlomo HaMelech, which is called Shir HaShirim, the Song of Songs. 
which is uh, a, a remarkable treatise on uh, the entire course of history, the entire development of uh, all the spiritual planes called the worlds, and uh, much, much more. It's, it's an extremely, extremely interesting uh, uh, work. It's one of the 24 books of the Bible, of the, of the entire Bible, the Tanakh. Um, and uh, it is called, in, uh, although it appears to be simply a love song, it is called by Rabbi Akiva, the great Rabbi Akiva, it is Kol, who lived um, around the time of the destruction of the Second Temple. We're talking about uh, first, second centuries. Uh, so Rabbi Akiva says, the Song of Songs is the Holy of Holies. The holiest, uh, so it says in the Song of Songs that there's a, there's a verse that, that says like this, His left hand is underneath my head and his right hand his right arm embraces me his left arm is under my head and his right arm embraces me so what does this mean um so our sages tell us that uh, rashi for example explains that the arm underneath the head is to raise up the head to lift up the head and the arm encircling the body is a symbol of, it's an expression of love. So if the first day of the week is love, the second day of the week is the hand underneath the head to raise the head up. That's what I mean when I say that it's the day of internalization, the day of internalizing, of moving inwards in order to move upwards. It's, a, it's an uplifting by turning within. It's represented primarily by Isaac, whereas the first day of the week is represented by Abraham, Abraham. The second day of the week is represented by Isaac, Yitzchak. The third day of the week uh, corresponds to Tiferet. Tiferet, again, this, this is the, uh, the third sphira, the sphira of Tiferet. And um, Tiferet has, um, let's see here if we can just, um, okay, yeah, that's what we're talking about now, okay, Tiferet, which is the idea of compassion. There's a difference between love and uh, compassion. Compassion has the idea of um, not just indiscriminate love, but discriminate love, let's call it that. Love which discriminates between um, certain situations. There are situations, according to Kabbalah, in which love is an inappropriate response. For example, to uh, when, you have it, when, when, when you have children, I'm sure you, uh, you all know this, that... Um, that children would eat ice cream and chocolate all day long if you would let them. And if one is a very, very kind parent, uh, you might want to let them because this is what they, 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 they love it so much. Would, but, but any parent with any brains in their head would obviously understand that this is not something that's good for them, even though they want it and therefore you want to give it to them. Obviously, you would want to withhold it for them at least until after dinner or uh, preferably even longer than that. In other words, you know, feed the child primarily healthy food most of the time. That's a concept of compassion. You have, even though the kindness would say, give him what he wants, the compassion would say, no, I have to give him what he needs. Not just what he wants. What he wants might not be the right thing. So you have compassion for, uh, for the person. I feel your pain, so to speak. I know what it is that you want. I would love to give it to you, but I know it's not good for you. And therefore, I'm going to give you what is good for you. There's a measure of gvura, of, um, of setting boundaries in compassion as well. Okay, and that corresponds to... Um, so, chesed or chesed is a little bit different. Chesed or chesed is... Chesed or chesed would be in chesed over here. And that chesed or chesed would be um, altruistic love, love for its own sake. 
Uh, here, it's not really love for its own sake. It's directed. It's for the sake of educating the child, for the sake of bringing up, for the sake of uh, making the child healthy, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that would correspond to the third uh, day of the week. The fourth day of the week would be would correspond to the sphera of Netzach. Um, one second here. All right, here we go. The sphera of Netzach. Um, okay, which is perseverance, confidence, trust, external security, the uh, ones underneath in the brackets on the negative, uh, by the way, they all have that, the negative quality, the negative quality, which you won't find actually in uh, Chochma and so on, and Keter. In any event, uh, the uh, the idea here, the idea of perseverance, the idea of confidence, trust, is also a quality which we have to um, inculcate in ourselves. But if you if you see it as um, as confidence and trust, we understand it has to do with other people as well. It's not just an internal thing. Perseverance is more of an internal quality. Whereas confidence and trust has to do with how I relate to the world outside primarily. External security, as we say over here. And therefore, the day of um, uh, the fourth day of the week, which, which, is, which is really Wednesday, is a time to start preparing for, uh, for it's the time to start preparing for the coming week. But the avoider called Yom Yom Avida Vidate, every day does its own work. The work of the day of Netzach is in uh, this this idea of perseverance, confidence, trust, etc., etc. Now I'm zipping through these a little bit fast because I want to get to the main one, which is uh, which is the Sabbath, as I said before. Okay, so hard would be acknowledgement, sincerity, internal certainty, or security, etc. Again, this would be already the fifth day of the week, Thursday. The fifth day of the week. So on that particular day, since this particular sphera is dominant on that day, therefore what should be dominant in, in our um, in, in our focus is this idea of acknowledgement, of sincerity, of internal certainty, security, etc. And of course doing the opposite of the negative qualities, deviousness, lying, cheating, etc., etc. Okay, uh, next, we're going again to uh, Yesod, and that is influence, empathy, contribution beyond ourselves. That is the concept of um, Friday. Friday is when, at least on Friday, is when we should uh, think about inviting other people um, to partake of, uh, of the Sabbath, to come and join us for the Sabbath. Uh, you might want to do that earlier, but at least it's an, an idea of contributing beyond yourself. In other words, not just thinking about your own self and your own loneliness or alienation or whatever it is, the negative qualities, but to be able to contribute beyond uh, oneself, which in fact takes care of the alienation and the loneliness. When you give uh, out to other people, and then it's different from chesed, um, this here is giving not so much um, giving things, but it's more giving influence, giving direction, giving um, uh, contributing to other people's um, to other people's being, to other people's uh, comfort, to other people's, and, and not necessarily in a, in a physical way, but more in a spiritual way. Your sword corresponds physically to the genital region of the person, and you can understand, therefore, what the contribution here, it's an inner contribution rather than uh, an outward, a more outward form. Finally, we come to Malchut. Um, Malchut represents the idea of humility and significance. Two seemingly opposite qualities, humility on the one hand and significance on the other. What do I do here? 
Okay. Uh, visible? <laughs> What's going on? Okay. Um, so, what is the quality, therefore, of the Sabbath, the Sabbath day? So, the quality of the Sabbath day, our sages tell us, there are two things. There are two aspects of the quality of the Sabbath day. On the one hand, you have the idea of um, what it says in the Ten Commandments, you shall not do any work on the Sabbath day. Do not do any work on the Sabbath day. But on the other hand, there's a much more important quality as well, which is mentioned later on in the Torah, in, in the parasha called Kitisa, where it says, Shabbat Vayinafash. Um, let me see if I can write it here. Um, okay, I'll write it in bigger letter so you'll be able to see. Uh, I'm going to write here. Um, that's not letting me write. Hmm. One second, let me see how I can do this. Uh, first of all. Okay, I'll just have to write in the box over here, so. Uh, yeah, it's going to be too complicated. <laughs> let me just, uh, let me just do this. Um, here, I'm going to write a word, and I'm going to, I'll write it in red, how about that, then, then everyone will be able to see it. It will be clear. Oh, yeah. No, gosh. Ah, oh, disappeared, look at that. Um, hmm. Disappeared because the box is not big enough. All right, let me see. Disappeared again. Okay, I'll have to make the box bigger, but it's going to go on to the next page. Where you know. Gosh. Okay. Do it in red. There you are. Everyone sees it? You can drop bigger. You can see it. Okay. Vayinafash. So the word. So again, there, there are two. Uh, there, there are two words, two concepts which describe the Sabbath. One concept which describes the Sabbath is you shall do no work on that day. In other words, it's, it's a cessation of creativity, a cessation of, uh, of, uh, of outward activity. It's a cessation of changing the world. But that's only the external aspect of the Sabbath. The internal aspect of the Sabbath is Vayinafash. The word Vayinafash is related to the word Nefesh. If we just, in Hebrew you can do this, it's not a difficult thing to do because the letters and the vowels are two different things. In Hebrew, the Torah is only written in consonants. It's not written in vowels. The vowels are part of the oral tradition. They're not the way you read the word, but not the way the word is written, only with letters, not vowels. So it's written as Vayi Nefesh. Right? Vayi Nefesh is Vayi Nefesh, so to speak. Meaning to say that this is the day of Nefesh, the day of soul. This is the soul day. The day in which we become involved with our souls. To the extent that our sages explain that everybody gets on the Sabbath day what's called an Ashoma Yaseira or a Nefesh Yaseira, an, an additional soul, so to speak. Now, what is this additional soul? This additional soul is a sort of, it's an, it's an inner illumination, a sort of, um, um, sort of an intuitive illumination that comes together with the day. Because the day is the day of physical rest, 
cessation of outward activity, of changing the world, of rectifying the world activity. In order to really rectify the world, two things are necessary. One is the act of rectification, which happens throughout the week. And when one comes to the, to, to, to the Sabbath, then one moves inwards again, just like with Gevura, one moves inwards, inwards and upwards, because Malchut is on the side. It's really very much influenced by Gevura. The female Sfira is influenced by Gevura. Ani Bina Li Gevura. And the same thing is true of Malchut. Malchut is a feminine Sfira. It's a feminine quality. But that feminine quality is the quality of receiving light from above, which is called the additional soul, the additional soul that a person receives, so to speak, on the Sabbath. Now, in terms of this additional soul, uh, so there's a very interesting uh, story that is told about, uh, about the Baal Shem Tov, that the Baal Shem Tov had special, as we all do, but he, he had special Sabbath garments. Uh, now, all of us do, in fact. Um, it is traditional to wear different clothing on the Sabbath than you would wear during the week. There's the weekday clothes, and then there's your Sabbath clothes. Sabbath clothes, and they're very different in style and in uh, etc. They have a certain amount of, uh, of, of holiness attached to them, so to speak. But what was interesting about the Baal Shem Tov's uh, garments is that they were bigger on the Sabbath than they were during the week. And in fact, um, one of his um, one of his disciples reported that there was a certain place that he used to stand, where the Baal Shem Tov used to stand, sort of under a projecting bookshelf when he prayed, but he couldn't stand there on the Sabbath because he was taller on the Sabbath than he was during the week. That extra soul, so to speak, not only affected him spiritually, but it also affected him physically. He became a, 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 a more, um, he became, so to, so to speak, more spread out. Became uh, uh, bigger, you know, physically bigger on Shabbos, on the Sabbath, than he was uh, during the week. Now, you would think that this, this sounds kind of uh, counterintuitive. You would expect, one would expect, that um, the physical component would, in a sense, shrink on the Sabbath. And the spiritual component would grow greater. That's what you would think. But it doesn't happen that way. And the reason it doesn't happen that way is because of the whole purpose of Malchut. The purpose of the sphere of Malchut is to bring godliness into the world. Not to be above the world, but to be in the world and yet be godly. That's the whole purpose of Malchut, and therefore Malchut corresponds also to the temple, to the tabernacle and to the temple. It is the idea of holiness within the world. Yes, there's a cessation of work on the Sabbath, a cessation of rectifying, but now instead of just rectifying the world, instead of rectifying the world, what is done now is that one delights in the world on the, on the Sabbath. There's rectifying, there's the building, there's the uh, construction and uh, repair, so to speak, the tikkun of the world that happens during the week. And then there is the harmony with the world that happens on the Sabbath. So therefore, it is traditional uh, in, in religious Jewish communities that that's the day of, uh, that, that a person, uh, Friday night is the time that uh, men, and, men and women have um, sexual relations, they get together, physical relations. Not that it's forbidden during the week, it's not, but that's set aside for actually, that day of the week is kind of set aside as a special time for physical intimacy. Why for physical intimacy? Because that's, so that physical intimacy is part of the whole concept of, um, of, um, of communion. But communion is not just a, a communion of soul to soul. 
it's a communion of soul to soul and body to body. In other words, soul to soul, the soul, uh, the, 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 the godliness that comes into the soul, but that the purpose of creation for which we were created to be in a physical body also achieves its highest spiritual um, peak on the Sabbath, which is why the Baal Shem Tov grew taller and, and larger on, uh, on the Sabbath. Now, um, just to uh, explain this a little bit more, we could take an analogy, the analogy of the temple. The whole purpose of the temple, which corresponds uh, essentially to the tabernacle and the temple, corresponds to the Svira of Malchut, as we said before. But the whole concept of the temple was, that, was not that, you should be a, that there should be a temple only in the higher worlds. Every world has its temple. Every level, spiritual level, has that level which is called a temple. The Beit HaMikdash, the holy place of that particular world. But the entire purpose is for the Shekhinah, the divine presence, to be closed within the world, to be revealed within the world, to be, be revealed within the physical. We also find um, one of the explanations of the Song of Songs. The Song of Songs, as I said before, uh, if anyone wants to read it, it's uh, well worth reading. Unfortunately, the translations are absolutely terrible. The translations are terrible. They <laughs> completely like, botch it. It doesn't matter which translation you look at. They... Uh, the nature of translating from one la one language to another causes it to be, um, you know, the, the, you just can't really translate. There's no direct way of translating one to one word to one word. So you have to explain it conceptually, and 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 it just like ruins the whole beauty of uh, Song of Songs. You really have to understand it in the original. In any event, if, if you even read it uh, in English, you'll see that it seems to be a love song. And what was it? It was there to express the communion of the soul with God. That's what it's all about. It's the communion of the soul with God. That's what the, what the whole song is about, all eight chapters of it. So um, the, uh, the question is asked, well, if you're talking about the communion of the soul of, of, of a person with God, why not... Um, explain that, use the analogy, rather than using the analogy of a, a male and female um, in coming into a union, the union of male and, male and female, the love between man and woman, and the embrace that they, that they share. Why, instead of using that analogy, why not use the analogy of a teacher and a student, for example? This question is asked, why not use the analogy of, a, of, of teacher and student? And there's two explanations given. One explanation given is that if you use the analogy of teacher and student, so the student is only the receiver, the student doesn't give. The student receives from the teacher. The student doesn't give back, so to speak. He doesn't make a contribution. He's so busy absorbing that he doesn't have any any ability to give back anything or to give out anything. That's one reason. A second reason is given, and that is that this analogy is used knowingly and precisely rather than a teacher-student relationship, because if we only talk about a student-teacher-student relationship, then the communion with God is only, it would seem to be only, at the time of Torah study and the time of prayer, and it would leave out the physical component, it would leave out the commandments, the mitzvot. Therefore, because the unification of male and female, the union, the communion of male and female, precisely involves the body as well, as well as the inner spiritual um, uh, communion, but it also involves a physical communion. And therefore, precisely, this was, this was the analogy used to express that the union or the communion is not only a spiritual thing, it is also a physical thing. 
by fulfilling the Torah, by, by, by doing the mitzvot, by performing the commandments of the Torah, which, which, uh, which demand a certain action, certain actions, therefore the communion can even be in the physical. In other words, the physical becomes spiritual. The physical itself is the highest expression of spirituality can be the highest expression of spirituality. And therefore, the body itself is affected by the advent of, uh, of the Sabbath. Of course, to be sensitive to that and to be aware of that and to focus on that and to, uh, and to, to really feel it, to, to, to feel it within ourselves, well, that might be um, a certain amount, it requires a certain amount of work, it requires a certain amount of sensitivity training, so to speak. Well, we have to be sensitive to it. We have to uh, learn to um, um, open ourselves up to that experience. But that's the experience. There's actually a very um, interesting book. Um, I forget what it's called now. I think it's When Black Becomes a Rainbow, if I'm not, mis if I'm not mistaken. Uh, in any event, it's about a woman who um, who initially did not um, know anything about uh, the Sabbath and how she started to sort of um, she she became aware of it and she was saying like previously she was a very spiritual person, very spiritual person, but she um, she um, her spirituality was only the spirituality of the heart. And the mind, but it wasn't the spirituality of the of the of the body. On the contrary, the body was seen as something to be despised, something to be disgusted with, and perhaps even uh, something to control by harsh means, you know, self-flagellation and things like that, and fasting and all kinds of um, things like that. It was only after she became aware of this concept that her whole way of looking at things actually changed. Um, that the spirituality of the day has to also do with eating and drinking and, uh, and sleeping, to, sleeping together and so on and so forth. Obviously man and wife, not, <laughs> not um, uh, just anybody. Um, but that that act can become a holy act. It's not just an act which is permitted. It's an act which is called holy. Matrimony in, uh, in Hebrew is called kiddushin. The word kiddushin really means holiness. It's to be set aside for holy purposes. So that concept of, uh, of, of, uh, of what's called in Kabbalah zivug, the zivugim, uh, the zivugim means the interplay and the interconnection of various svirot and various parts of him, clusters of svirot. That concept of zivug is integral to Kabbalistic thought. And it's an expression of the concept of unity. Unity is not just a spiritual thing. Unity must include the physical world as well. The physical world is not outside of God. It's not something that has to be despised or run away from or, uh, or, or uh, dismissed. It itself, the world becomes a holy place. As the Medrash, which I've quoted many times before, says, and God wanted a dwelling place in the lower worlds. In other words, that the lower worlds themselves become holy. And that's why on the Sabbath it says, Vayinafash, Vayinafash, that the nefesh gets an extra measure of holiness, a second soul, so to speak, enters a person on the Sabbath. In other words, an extra degree of holiness and sensitivity and, uh, and, and, and joy and, uh, and so on and so forth. And um, that has to be sort of cultivated and appreciated for, for what it is. Okay, so... Um, 
Are there any questions? I think I can uh, stop the share now. Let's see. Yep. Okay. Any questions, folks? Is anyone there? <laughs> All right. So if there are no questions, oh, here we go. Um, the duality of the spherot. I'm not sure what you mean, you the duality of the spherot, that each, each sphera has um, positive and negative qualities, is that what you mean? Or that each sphera... Um, has a counterpoint in the in the one opposite it. I'm not sure what you mean over there. That each sphera has yes. So there's uh, each 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 sphera has a positive aspect, and it could have a negative aspect as well. Let me just share again. Um, just share the screen again. Uh, if you have a look at the sphera over here, you will see. Uh, let's just start from the top. Keter does not have any negative quality to it. Chochmah does not have any negative quality to it. Bina does not have any negative quality to it. Da doesn't have any negative quality. Those are the intellectual spherot, intellectual qualities, powers of the soul. Where the negative qualities start is with the emotions. The emotions uh, can lead to can lead, not necessarily do, but can lead to negative qualities, which is why we have to have the heart controlled by the mind. The mind rules over the heart, uh, as we explained in a previous lesson, uh, why that is. Now, of course, the heart also affects the mind, and that's the way it's supposed to be, but the negative qualities of uh, the emotions, the, the things that can come as, cause us to become entangled in the wrong kind of a way, that has to be uh, sort of ironed out by using uh, by using the intellect, and particularly the quality of self-negation or self-nullification, rather, uh, which is a quality of intellect. Um, do the days have a negative quality only if you let them? Um, the day itself could be... Um, it could be. It could start off as a negative quality, but by transforming it, by thinking about the uh, the positive quality and working on the positive quality of it, um, it's likely to transform the day into positive. Uh, why is everyone seems to be the one must participate in physical ret? Physical. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, I don't see the rest of the sentence. Um, there is asking, is it similar to perseverance? Perseverance can become stubbornness, yes. Perseverance can become stubbornness, yes. That is a good point. Uh, in fact, I will add that to the picture. Um, defiance, stubbornness, stubbornness, I guess you answer, yeah. There we go. And worry. There you go. Got it. Terry, very good point. Um, is the negative quality of ego? It's involved with ego, yes, but it, it is a quality that can become, for instance, Gavura, can become a negative quality if we, we can look at it as a negative thing, but if we use it in the right way, it's self-control in order to raise ourselves up to a higher level. Now, let me just uh, explain this. Uh, it's a very, very interesting thing. A religious, the religious life of a person, a person who's a religious person, is controlled by his own self-control. Right? A religious person tries to follow the dictates of his or her religion and therefore controls himself or herself 
in order to live up to those usually high standards and values. What about someone who is irreligious, atheistic? Like, what does he or she, um, what basis do they use for control? So very often the control has to come in from outside. In other words, like um, uh, being controlled by, by a certain ideology or certain group or a certain um, uh, or government and things like that. The control is usually forced in from the outside. You'll find that, uh, that, that atheistic societies generally like, uh, like China, like Russia was during the Stalin years, are very oppressive societies. It's laws are forced onto people. It doesn't come from within. It either has to come from within or from without. If it doesn't come from within because it's a secular society, then it comes from without and it's forced from, from the outside. And um, uh, so, uh, of course, that could that that that, that could there, there could be negative qualities that come as a result of that, of course. But um, where there's self control and self direction from inside, because one is following a spiritual path, then one doesn't need these outside controls. They're much the inner controls are much stronger than the out one, the outer ones. The outer ones lead to resistance. The inner ones are, if we, if we follow them willingly, uh, there's, there, there shouldn't be any resistance. Um, okay, uh, one is man to rest on, sleep on shaman. On the other hand, I can't sleep even if I try. Is one really mandated to sleep? Um, no, not necessarily. I mean, um, I know people that sleep far less on the Sabbath than... Um, because I got many more things to do. <laughs> the the Lubavitcher Rebbe, for example, uh, he didn't sleep on a Sabbath afternoon. He he, brained, he, uh, he spoke and he uh, he taught the entire entire afternoon usually. Uh, is it possible to plan meetings? I mean, in mind prevailing sphere of the day, focusing on this specific sphere. Sphere, yes, uh, it is. Uh, it should rather be done. I mean, I don't think you have to tell everybody what you're doing, but um, you know, uh, it, it for sure can be done, and uh, it probably will be of benefit. In other words, if the meeting is on, um, you know, on a um, on a Tiferi today, like on a, on a Tuesday of the week, right? So then the the the, the, the focus should be on like sort of harmonizing things and uh, and getting things, you know. To, to, to work together, uh, matching and uh, working together, harmonizing. Whereas if it's a Gvura day, that's more a concept of dividing and, and uh, you know, assigning individual tasks and getting each person to um, find within himself what the best that he could, uh, his, his best or her best um, abilities found within through introspection and so on and so forth that would be a, like a guru day you know that kind of thing yes i think it would be an interesting exercise to uh, to actually try that uh you want to know more about it you can get it <laughs> okay um i don't know what we're going to do about that but um well, there is a recording, <laughs> Terry. Maybe that'll work, but um, we could talk more about it. We could perhaps um, um, give some more concrete examples, uh, probably on another occasion. It's already an hour, but um, sometimes people have a spiritual uplift. Yeah, for sure you have a spiritual uplift uh, during, during the Sabbath. Yes, that's for sure. For sure you have a spiritual uplift, but the spiritual uplift should not be only spiritual. It should affect the physical world as well. That's, that's the point that we're making. It should be a spiritual uplift, but it should also affect the, um, the spiritual as well. 